The revolution's begun The time to stand up has come We are the rocking of the throne We are the rocking of the throne I'm Victor Tiffany with Revolt Against Plutocracy, the organization behind the Bernier Bus Strategy. We established this channel, as longtime subscribers know, in order to address our Bernier Bus critics, or in this case, naysayers. So I'm going to talk about an article authored by Joshua Howland. I'm going to read it and re reply to his uh, viewpoints, his misstatements, and so forth. And I'm going to make a three-point uh, case as to why Bernie Sanders is the candidate to defeat Donald Trump. And I'm going to tack on to the end of this video about a 25-minute interview with the local Democratic Socialists of America so you can understand fully why we're arguing swing voters matter. But let me begin with Holland's article published in Alternet uh, just this week. He wrote, Democrats, worst nightmare? Question mark. Here's the truth about the freakout over Bernie or Bust. That's the title. On Wednesday, Chapel Trap House host and self identified leftist dirtbag Will Meneker caused a stir when he vowed that he would not vote for Democratic nominee unless it is Bernie Sanders and suggested his followers might do the same. In a tweet, Meneker writes or tweeted, I won't vote for anyone but Bernie in the general. I can't say what the hundreds of thousands of people who listen to my show will do, but I'm only speaking for myself. Just something to consider. Holland goes on in uh, italicized font. Nice pluralistic democracy you have here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. Let's start there. This is not a democracy. We have a plutocracy. That was concluded in 2015 by two political scientists. We have an oligarchy. We don't have a democracy. So right away you get the sense that Holland is not exactly clued into what radicals understand about American political order. Holland continues, Maneker's tweet went viral and others joined in pledging they too were Bernie or Bust. As one might have expected, this elicited the usual hand-wringing among majority of Democrats and Dem-leaners who prioritized defeating Trump over ideology and policy, according to polls and presumably over left f factionalism. None of that has a link to it. So I don't know what uh, Democrats are hand-wringing. We hope they're hand-wringing. We hope they fully understand the depth of what this the Bernie or Bust implies. If Bernie's not the nominee, Trump will be reelected. But there's more to it than just Bernie or Bust. We're going to get to that in a little bit. He goes on. This threat would be more effective if we hadn't seen the story play out before. In spring of 2016, Wall Street Journal poll found that a third of Sanders supporters wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton if she became the nominee. Tens of thousands of people signed the Bernie or Bust pledge. All this led to a significant freakout with one salon writer warning that Bernie supporters could blow this election and the Huffington Post column is calling it the Democrats' worst nightmare. All that's true. While some of Sanders' Democratic opponents now view it as an article of faith that the refusal of some Sanders supporters to back Clinton through the election to Trump, the evidence suggests otherwise. Stop. No, it doesn't. The evidence is very clear. There were enough Sanders-Trump swing voters in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania to throw those states to Trump. That, that's not in doubt. That is a fact. We have a poll. We have uh, bar, you know, data showing that this is, in fact, the case. Holland continues, a higher share of his supporters in 2016 primaries voted for Clinton in the general election than her voters backed in Obama in 2008. They also backed Clinton at a higher rate than Rubio and Kasich voters supported Trump in 2016. I don't know what that second sentence means, but let's talk about the first one. A higher share of Bernie supporters in the 2016 primaries voted for Clinton in the general election than her voters backed 
Clinton in, or Obama in 2008. That is correct. A quarter, a quarter of Clinton's party unity, my ass, racist supporters who backed Hillary in the primaries wouldn't vote for wouldn't vote for Obama. They voted directly for John McCain. I say they're racist. You come up with another reason. When Obama and Clinton were in fact ideologically so closely aligned to each other. Their differences were minor. It was race. But here's what he misses. This is the context that he's just ignoring. This is the lie of omission in this paragraph. In 2008, we were at the front edge of the Great Recession. So there was this vast swath of swing voters who shifted away from the Republicans, who they blamed for the recession, falsely, because it was Bill Clinton that signed the deregulation of Wall Street that led to that Great Recession. But they've abandoned the Republicans, switched over to Democrats, and that and turnout by Obama supporters, particularly black Americans, is how Obama won. Turnout and swing voters combined is how Obama won in 2008 and, they were, and because of the economy that swing vote was strong enough to override uh, Hillary Clinton's racist party unity my ass voters. Holland continues. What about Sanders supporters going third party? According to research by political scientist John Sides in 2016 about as many Obama 2012 voters backed third party candidates as Mitt Romney's and 2012 backers did. I'm not sure what that means. He continues, due to data limitations, we can't know how many disaffected Sanders supporters simply stayed home. Wrong. We do know. It was about 260,000. 2% of Bernie's total supporters, according to polls, stayed home. So we do know that number. It wasn't all that many. It was just over or right around a quarter of a million of Bernie's stayed home. And they probably thought that was Bernie or Bust because that's what the media kept describing Bernie or Bust as. But it wasn't. It was voting green or writing in Bernie Sanders in 2016. The only, this is an interesting second part of the sentence, Holland continues, but the only demographic that showed a decline in turnout between 2012 and 2016 were black Americans who had broken for Clinton by 8 to 2 margin in the primaries. That's fascinating, don't you think? The very class of voters, black Americans, who basically gave Clinton the nomination, didn't come out for her. Didn't come out to vote for her. They, too, could have claimed responsibility for Hillary Clinton's defeat, just as the Sanders Trump swing voters could have claimed responsibility, or the 1.7 million voters who filled out a ballot but left the top line blank also could have claimed responsibility for the defeat of Hillary Clinton. But they didn't because they're not organized. They're forces of nature. Unlike Bernie or Bust, we are organized. And we would have claimed responsibility, but we fell short in Pennsylvania. Howland continues, as I wrote in 2016 for The Nation, none of this was new or unique to Sanders supporters or the 2016 race. Apparently he's quoting himself ironically in 2008. It was Clinton supporters vowing to stay home or vote for McCain if Obama became the nominee. That May, primary exit polls found fewer than half of Clinton's supporters in Indiana and North Carolina saying they'd consider voting for Obama in the general election. Even in early July, after Obama had secured the nomination, only 54% of Clinton's backers said they planned to vote for him. Those self-described Pumas, party unity my ass, may have stayed home by the dozens that November. But at the end of the day, 9 out of 10 Democrats supported Obama in an election that featured the highest turnout in 40 years. There you have it. Turnout. What he doesn't talk about is because the, again, because of the economy, there was swing. Swing voters abandoned the red team who were in power and went with the blue team because the economy was crashed and they wanted change. He also claims a similar dynamic played out with Howard Dean supporters in 2004. He continues, 
in this article, the takeaway from all this is that in every election cycle, a small share of primary voters won't vote for their party's nominee unless it's their preferred candidate. And that's true regardless of who wins the nomination. That is correct so far. Then he continues, if Sanders loses this year's primary race, a small number of his backers will stay home, vote for Trump, or vote third party. And if he wins, that will be true of a small number of people who supported other candidates. That's true. The problem he doesn't point out, or what he's the lie of omission, or maybe it's ignorance on his part, is that that small number is as high as uh, 39% of Bernie Sanders supporters. That small number is significantly larger than the small number of Warren or bus voters or Biden or bus voters. 20% of Warren's supporters are not committed to vote blue if she's not the nominee. 20%, a small number as he said. 39% of Bernie supporters are not committed to vote blue no matter who if he's not the nominee. We have the data that supports that. So he's downplaying the difference, the increased electoral leverage Bernie Sanders has over any other Democratic Party nominee. And he quotes somebody, a Warren supporter, who doesn't like Trump and doesn't like Bernie. I've looked at her profile on Twitter. He quotes her, in other news, I'm not ever voting for Bernie, Buttigieg, or Bloomberg. So everyone better get their shit together and vote for Warren. The path to glory lies with Warren. In this add-on video, I'm going to tack on to the end, I express a willingness to wager a thousand hours to anyone that if Bernie's not the nominee, Trump will be re-elected. And I've offered that bet to her. We'll see if she takes me up on that bet on Twitter. Holland continues, given the razor-thin margins by which Trump eked out of electoral college win in 2016, even a small number, even a small share of Democratic base, staying home, or voting for someone other than the party nominee has the potential to swing the outcome to Trump. True. But we can't know if more people will sit out in an election if one candidate or another candidate wins the nomination. False. That's, the, that's what I just explained. We can know. Polls show. At the same time, research shows that people further from the center of the ideological spectrum, that would be Bernie supporters and Trump supporters, tend to be more engaged, more likely to volunteer, donate to campaigns, and of course vote. Put those two sentences together. Polls tend to find a larger share of Bernie Sanders backers saying they won't vote for anyone else. That's the leverage. And at the same time, research shows that people further from the center tend to be more engaged, to volunteer and donate and vote. In other words, Bernie is easily the best candidate to challenge and defeat Donald Trump for the very two reasons he's pointing out right there. But he doesn't make that conclusion. He goes on, with what's at stake in this election, it's appropriate to worry about everything. But even if those who threaten to sit this one out are entirely sincere now during the primaries, this picture is going to look very different come November after a five-month general election campaign. And arguably, the single most important difference between this election cycle and the last is that in 2016 most people thought Donald Trump couldn't win. And this time around everyone knows he can. He would lose that argument. Because arguably the biggest difference is this time Trump is President of the United States and he can claim credit for this economy. And he will. He is claiming credit for this economy. He's running on low inflation, high stock market value, low unemployment, and high consumer confidence. He's got the economic wind at his back. And no president since World War II has lost re-election. Uh, and this is a point I make with this add-on video in the, in, in, that I'm going to clip on here at the end. <laughs> so, he's wrong there. He, he would lose that argument. At least in swing states, it's unlikely many Dems will conclude they have the luxury of risking a second term of madness, corruption, and naked bigotry that marked the first. That's his concluding sentence.
from this article. Let me go back to 2016, the Nation article, when he wrote, the Democratic coalition is going to come out in force to stop Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. The fact of the matter is, you can't really trust what Holland's saying. He is a neoliberal asset. He is a propagandist for the blue no matter who type. And he's just flat out wrong. He's wrong to ignore the context of the economy. He's wrong to argue that the big difference is that Trump is uh, electable. No, the big difference is that he's an incumbent president with the kind of economic winds at his back. That's the big difference, biggest difference. And he's wrong about Bernie or Busters, willing to vote for any blue, no matter who. So there's three arguments. That's the end of my critique of Holland. There's three arguments about electability. One is turnout. This is promoted by Rachel Bitkoffer. She had an article in Political. And her big thing, the reason she was able to predict the 2018 midterm so successfully is she predicted with Trump in the White House, the blue turnout would be huge and, and there would be a blue wave in the House. And she was right about that. Within one, swing, one uh, uh, sw switch, one turnover, one election. That's her view. It's turnout. Turnout matters. The other theory is swing voters matter, right? That's that's the people who will swing one way or the other depending on the state of the economy, mostly. Those are the people who abandon the red team for the blue team when the economy was in a free fall. The stock market was in a free fall in 2008. This time, they're not going to swing that way. They're going to stay with Trump. And there are swing voters who back Bernie, and they say they're going to back Trump again in swing states if he's not the nominee. They matter. They are significant. That They are the leverage, part of Bernie Sanders' leverage, and part of the swing voter calculus. And then the third calculation here is leverage. Who has the most leverage? That is to say, whose supporters are least party loyal? or most party disloyal, however you want to frame it. So let's look at all three. Turnout. Bernie Sanders has an army of volunteers looking for people who are poor, who people who don't vote. And they're letting people know about Bernie, that he has, he wants higher minimum wage, he wants free health care for all, and he wants uh, free college education. This is a, a, a coming from a study by Tama Piketty that these poor people who won't vote normally will come out for someone like Bernie Sanders. He has the advantage in turnout. What about swing voters? Polling shows independents prefer Bernie Sanders over any other Democrat running. And there's 1.5 million, we believe they're independent swing voters who registered Democrat, voted for Bernie in the primaries, and then they want change. They voted for Trump, and they're telling pollsters, again, watch the video after this one, they're telling pollsters three times in 2019 that they're going to vote for Trump again. And then there's the leverage. Who has the most leverage? And that's what I point out by this uh, poll, Emerson poll, showing that 39% of Bernie supporters are not committed to vote blue, whereas only 22% of Biden supporters like that, and 20% of Warren's. So he wins on all three. He wins on turnout, he wins on swing votes, and he wins on the um, leverage issue. He's got more leverage than the other, any other candidate. Now, the interview with the local chapter of the Democratic Party, or the Democratic Socialist of America. Thank you. Welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Wales Brown. Our guest today is Victor Tiffany, 
Um, Victor, you are the founder of an organization. What, what is the organization called? Revolt Against Plutocracy. And when did you found it? 2015. In connection with the Sanders campaign? Right. right. We needed an organization to serve as a foundation for our strategy. Okay. Uh, and you say ours, so you were a group of people. It's a committee of anywhere from three to seven, eight people. All here in Ithaca or no across the country? No one's here just me, all across the country. Okay. And we can describe you as a long-time political activist. And Correct. Yep. So this is not the first uh, a campaign you've been involved in? Not even close. Okay. Uh, well, you founded this organization in 2015, 2016, uh, with the purpose of helping out the Sanders campaign. And, and you can tell a bit about what you did back then, but I'm interested in hearing about your reading of the voting public now and how they may vote sure. in the coming election. I'm going to make some claims that are going to sound um, hard to believe, perhaps, for people who really want a woman in the White House or really think uh, Joe Biden is the guy to defeat Donald Trump. So everything I'm going to say is backed up by references on our website, citizens, I'm sorry, climate2020.us, as in the United States. Climate2020.us. Right. So I'm going to talk about polling data. It's visualized in the video there. And then there's links to every bit of uh, the information that I'm going to convey. Because what I'm going to convey is pretty... Uh, hard for some people to believe. What we looked at this year, or last year, I keep forgetting we, this is 2020. This is 2020, yes. What we looked at is a survey of Bernie Sanders supporters, people who voted for him in the primaries of 2016, and how they voted in the general election. 78% of Sanders supporters voted for Hillary Clinton, giving her the popular vote. 12% of Sanders supporters voted directly for Donald Trump. 8% voted for third party. That's the Bernie or Bust faction. And 2% stayed home. Okay, Bernie or Bust defined, uh, defined as either you nominate Bernie or else... We're voting Green Party in, in 2016. It was also a write-in option, but they weren't included in the survey or they just threw them in with a third party. Hmm. What we... What they showed uh, further along in that survey is in Wisconsin, in Michigan, and in Pennsylvania, those Sanders-Trump swing voters were more numerous than Trump's margin of victory. In other words, they could have claimed responsibility for the defeat of Clinton or for Trump's victory. They could have claimed responsibility for that, mm -hmm. but they didn't because... There's no organization. Like Bernie or Bus has an organization, Revolt Against Plutocracy. Those swing voters have no organization. They're like a force of nature, the, uh, like a tornado. You know, someone asked me, how are we going to stop them? And it's like getting up on your rooftop and yelling at a tornado coming your way. Move! Change direction! Don't come this way. You can't. Mm -hmm. I think of them as dark matter because they were completely invisible to us in 2016. We had no idea that they were there. We had no idea that these swing voters, these Sanders supporters who would vote for Trump existed in any sort of numbers. But in fact, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, there was enough of them to cause Trump to get elected. Have you found out anything about their motives? Uh, did they do it out of spite? Or, or there might have been a little bit of spite, but mm -hmm. if that were primary, then they'd be gone. Right? Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be as many today as there were then. And I'm going to talk about 2019 mm -hmm. polling, but before mm -hmm. I do, these swing voters, first of all, they're a subsidiary of a larger group of Obama. They voted for Obama twice and voted for Trump. So there's mm -hmm. even more of them. Mm -hmm. And what we think is they're working class people who have given up on the Democratic Party. And if the Democratic Party wants these swing voters back, they're going to have to have a working class hero as the nominee. And I'm going to make the case that if Bernie Sanders is not the nominee, these swing voters or make it impossible for Biden, or Warren, or Buttigieg, or Bloomberg, or Booker, or anyone else to defeat Donald Trump. It's going to take somebody who's going to unify the Democratic Party. But before I get into 2019 polling, I just want to make a point about 
swing voters. Mm -hmm. Go back to 2008. Yeah. Hillary Clinton had 25% of the people who voted for her in the primaries vote for John McCain. 25%. That's double the percentage of Bernie supporters. And I also want one more point about how they voted in the general election. 9% mm -hmm. of the people, Democrats, who voted for Obama in the primaries voted for John McCain. So it's not always a rational process. You know, what motivates them might be emotions, it might be propaganda coming from the television. Who knows? But it's, it, it's, it's party loyalty or party disloyalty didn't begin with Sanders Trump voters or Bernie or Bust. It began at least with, in 2008 when the, the so-called party unity my ass mm -hmm. Clinton supporters voted mm -hmm. for McCain. They had a pack set up too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't have been surprised in 2016 if they would have rose up again had Bernie been able to actually get enough votes to win the nomination. I think they would have sabotaged Bernie in exactly the same way the Sanders Trump voters sabotaged Hillary Clinton. I think that, that these party unity my ass folks would have mm -hmm. actually voted f directly for Donald Trump the same way they mm -hmm. did for McCain. But that's mm -hmm. that's in the past. And and the question that needs to be asked is so what? That's ha that was 2016. This is 2020. After 3 years of Trump, surely these swing voters know not to support Trump. So, in you don't think April, so? Is it? Here it is. In April uh, last year, an Emerson College poll showed and this Got a couple headlines around the internet. 26% of Sanders supporters will vote for Trump if Warren, Elizabeth Warren, is the nominee. Even though she's supposedly close to his, his uh, policies, his social democracy, or what, you know, his progressive agenda, they won't vote for her. They're going to vote mm -hmm. for Trump. And, mm -hmm. and that's a fairly small sample size, so it's a margin of error about plus minus 10%. Um, that was... April. In November, a Business Insider poll had a headline that was, I swear, designed to confuse the readers. Two-thirds of Bernie supporters will, will, will vote for Warren in the general election. That was the headline. Mm -hmm. But the news is 33% of Sanders supporters will not vote for Warren. 33% is larger than the 26% of the Emerson because mm -hmm. Emerson, they're going to vote for Trump. 33% is they're not going to vote for Warren, meaning some of them will vote for Trump, some of them will vote third party. They include the Bernie mm -hmm. or Busters and the Sanders Trump, so it's a larger percentage. And the reason it's news is because in 2016, the, the contest was close enough that the 12% the mattered. Yeah, they swung the election. So just a just a kind of a footnote on these percentages, because the percentages are a lot higher, twenty six percent versus twelve percent, for example, doesn't mean that the number of people are any higher. Because Bernie Sanders' support at this point is about half what it was by the end of the primary season. It was thirteen point two million people voted for Bernie in the primaries. So twelve percent of them is about a million and a half. So. To, 24% of half that number of supporters now, roughly, according to the polls, yeah. is still one and a half million people, roughly. The number of people who are swing voters, Sanders Trump swing voters, hasn't doubled just because the percentage has doubled. They're about the same as they were in 2016. And okay. they won the election in 2016, and they're telling pollsters they're going to do it again. I'm wondering whether the candidates themselves have any agency here. Do, uh, do the voters even listen to what the candidates say? Apparently not. Uh, in, <laughs> in 2016, at the Democratic Convention, uh, Bernie got up on stage and, and lifted up Hillary's hand and, and suggested all his supporters should vote for her. Correct. But evidently they, they didn't all listen, they didn't all obey. They, Clearly. I mean, we made it very clear in Philadelphia that we weren't going to be supporting. This is the Bernie or Bust faction that mm -hmm. we weren't going to be supporting. We had a uh, billboard on the highway between the airport and downtown that said, nominate Sanders or lose in November. And we didn't have any polling to back that up. That was bluster. That was pure mm -hmm. bluster. This time around, we know if they don't nominate Bernie Sanders, 
These swing voters are going to once again vote for Trump, and they're going to lose. The mm. fact of the matter is, because of these swing voters, as long as the economy remains in good shape, as long as the unemployment rate stays low, like it is now, these swing voters have already decided the outcome this year. Either Bernie Sanders is the nominee for the Democratic mm -hmm. Party, or Trump will be reelected. So only a crash of the economy could change their mind? Because unemployment goes up. So the, the, the statistic that I'm, I have in mind, and you actually hear this on television from time to time, is since World War II, 10 presidents have run for re-election, seven of them have won re-election. The three that didn't all had high unemployment. The hmm. seven who did had lower unemployment, either low unemployment, or in the case of Ronald Reagan, it was over 7%, but it was he got elected when it was over 11%. So the unemployment rate was moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. and the voters gave him a chance to keep moving it down in the right direction. But, so they all had good employment numbers. Even though, as Bernie Sanders points out, the economy's not good for someone working two or three jobs, and they don't have health care. That's not working for everybody, sure, clearly. Mm -hmm. But it's working for enough people that this election is going to be close. So an Emerson College poll in November, another mm -hmm. Emerson College poll, uh, uh, compared, matched up Bernie with Trump. What were, mm -hmm. uh, how did that come out? Tr Bernie won by 1% in that poll. Biden versus Trump, yeah. even. Yeah. Warren versus Trump, Sand, uh, Trump by 1%. Did they break it down by electoral votes? Cause they didn't break it down by state, by swing vote. This is mm. a nationwide thing. Mm. The point is, it's going to be close. And the reason it's going to be close is because unemployment rate is very low. So how do you defeat an unemployment? You have to have a unified party. That same poll that showed those yeah. four ma matchups, Buttigieg was the other one, and he clearly lost to Trump. Mm -hmm. But... It, Further down in the poll, uh, the post about that poll, mm -hmm. about that month's polling, they talked about party loyalty. 93% of Buttigieg's, Buttigieg's supporters are likely, very likely, to support the nominee. Twenty percent or 80% of Warrens are very likely to support the nominee. 70, the question was, if it's somebody else, if it's somebody else will you support the nominee? Yeah. 77% of Biden supporters are very likely to support the nominee. 61% of Bernie supporters are very likely to support the nominee. He has the greatest amount of party disloyalty, hmm. which means if he's not the nominee, the party will, will not be united. And if he is a nominee, he's the candidate who can unite the party better than any other candidate because of that, that set of statistics hmm. that I just read. He's the only one, if the race is tight enough, if mm -hmm. this contest is close enough, mm -hmm. where, where the swing voters in swing states rule, okay, I'll vote for Bernie in the general, but I'm not, if he's not the nominee, I'll vote for Trump. Those voters have already decided if Bernie's not the nominee, Trump gets reelected. So if Bernie's not the nominee, Donald Trump will be reelected. That, that's not reading tea leaves, that's not conjecture, mm -hmm. that's a foregone conclusion based on the survey of the 2016 election and voters and the polls, mm -hmm. of three separate polls in 2019 that confirm Bernie has the most electoral leverage. Some people may not like that term because they don't like being told who they have to vote for. But the fact of the matter is almost 70% of Democrats, number one concern when they vote is to kick out Donald Trump. They'll vote mm -hmm. for someone whose policies they don't agree with if that candidate has the best chance of defeating Trump. I'm so certain about that conclusion that only Bernie Sanders can defeat Trump that I will wager up to a thousand hours to anyone if, if Biden's the nominee, Trump gets reelected. If Warren's the nominee, Trump gets reelected. If Buttigieg or Booker or uh, the billionaire gets elected or nominated. Yeah. Trump gets reelected. I'm certain of this because of what these polls, because of what we saw happen mm -hmm. in 2016, because it's going to be a close race. Let's say there's a stock market crash. Let's say yeah. it's not close. Yeah. 
because of the same data that I cited just now about very likely to support the nominee or not mm -hmm. very likely, Bernie still can unite the party better than anyone else. That is his thing. And, and one more thing about Bernie Sanders. If you're going to defeat an incumbent president that has low unemployment, you have to do two things. You have to unite the party, but that's not going to be enough mm -hmm. because Trump has a lot of support. By the way, his approval rating right now, Trump's, is the same as Obama's at this point in his re-election bid. So don't underestimate this president just because you don't like him. He, he, he's got great skill at selling himself. And the, uh, the other thing that Bernie brings to the table that no other candidate does is his quote-unquote political revolution. What that means is he's going to motivate people who don't normally vote. Working people, working, uh, sorry, poor people, poorly educated people, millions of Americans don't vote in this country. But he got elected to mayor of Burlington by motive getting these people out and getting them registered to vote, and, and, and they voted and made him the mayor. His well, political revolution is nothing more than motivating non-voters to come out and vote. Well, in Burlington, he could do that by going to see people and talk to them. And, right. Uh, 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 can he do that on a nationwide basis? Bernie has something, again, no other candidate has. Mm -hmm. Actually, two things. Yeah, right. One, an army of a million volunteers. Every night you see people saying, hey, get on and start calling people. And, or canvassing. They're going mm -hmm. door to door. He, so he has this army of a million people, no other candidate does. And they have what's called burn app. This, in 2016, Sanders used the DNC voter database. And there was a big problem when the firewall went down and, you know, they blocked him from using the database for a while and there was a lawsuit and this and that. This time around, he said, they learned their lesson. They mm -hmm. went out and bought their own voter database, national mm -hmm. database, every voter, every registered voter in the country. Mm -hmm. And this burn app, which you download mm -hmm. to your phone, mm -hmm. is linked to that voter database. So when you meet somebody on the street... You enter their information. You update them. Who's your Who's your first choice? Who's your second choice? Mm -hmm. Are you registered to vote? So that's how he's finding these people. He's got an army of volunteers finding these non-voters. Are you registered to vote? Do you know about Bernie's agenda? He wants to raise the minimum wage. Working class stuff. He wants to, free college, right? These are poorly educated people. They'd go to college if they could afford it. They can't afford it because they mm -hmm. want to improve their lot in life. They're not, they're not poorly educated by choice. They're poorly educated because they could never afford to go to college. He's offering them an opportunity to go to college or trade school or community college. All that's included in his free college program. So he's, he, he, they'll come out and vote for somebody. And, and there's a study that was published in 2018 by French political economist Thomas Piketty. And he showed Studying 70 years of voter behavior in the United States, France, and England, he showed that these voters, these non-voters, will mm -hmm. come out for a social democrat, somebody like Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. So that's what Sanders brings to this, to this possibility of defeating Trump. One, un uniting the party like no other candidate can, and two, broadening the party mm -hmm. to include people who give up on voting because they're they just they're tired they don't want to vote for these neoliberals and, and this corporate oriented policies that have been coming out of Washington for four decades now. So but they'll come out for someone like Bernie Sanders. Well and, this is interesting for the DSA to hear, among other things. I don't know if you were following at at the DSA National Convention last summer, uh, a resolution passed that said we're endorsing Bernie and if he isn't chosen, we're not going to endorse any other candidate. What was the name of that resolution? It was called the Bernie or Bust Resolution. Mm -hmm. By our standards, it was pretty weak tea. Uh -huh. right? Because it didn't say anything about how you'll vote. It just says mm -hmm. who you endorse. And mm -hmm. frankly, I doubt Elizabeth Warren wants the endorsement mm -hmm. of a, a socialist organization. Mm -hmm. right? that's not gonna, in her view, that's not going to help her with moderate swing voters. Another thing about uh, Bernie's agenda is most people support it. Most people support mm -hmm. action on climate change. Mm -hmm. Most people support free education, free college, free trade school. Mm -hmm. Most people support raising the minimum wage. Most people support Medicare for all. His agenda is populism. 
real populism. Mm -hmm. So if he's the nominee, you're going to have genuine populism versus fake populism. You'll have honesty versus dishonesty. You'll have climate action and climate preservation versus, in my view, human extinction. That's what's at stake in this election. I know there's a lot of policies out there that people consider most, most, more important, like Medicare for all. And for people who don't have health care, obviously that is very important. But the fact of the matter is, if we don't do something about climate change, and we're very late in this game, there are, it's, it's not just, it's not enough. Green New Deal, mm -hmm. as big as he's proposing, $16.2 trillion of spending, as big as that is, bias, that would have been sufficient 40 years ago. Getting trans, you know, transforming the energy sector from fossil fuels to mm -hmm. sustainable batteries and hydrogen and wind power and everything else. But it's not now. There's too much carbon in the atmosphere. We also need carbon capture. Mm -hmm. And even if you have that 100% accomplished, 100, you know, if, if, if carbon were to come down to, you know, below 350 parts per million, which is supposedly the threshold, yeah. you still got way too much methane that's been released due to fracking, due to leaky gas pipes, due to the one and a half or close to one and a half degree Celsius warming that's taken place, there's methane leaking all across the Arctic shelf. It's, it's just bubbling up, it's uh, evaporating and bubbling up out of the water. That's underway. There's multiple positive warming feedback loops in place, which means we're very late in this game. It's not enough just to transform the energy into from fossil fuels to green, it's not enough to capture carbon, which is growing trees or creating these massive wood floats to grow seaweed out in the ocean, right? That's a carbon sink that'll suck mm -hmm. up carbon and turn it into oxygen. It's not enough to do those two things. We also have to cool the planet, because that's the only way you're, we're going to be able to um, stop this positive feedback loop. They're, they're already in place, right? The forest fires. In California, mm -hmm. in Brazil, and in Australia, Australia of course. Um, that's leading to more heat in the atmosphere, more carbon in the atmosphere, which is going to lead to drier conditions and warming atmosphere, which is going to lead to more forest fires, which is going to lead to more warming and more forest fires. So okay, so it feeds on itself, yes. The yes, Arctic yes, ice I, is another one. And I can say it that... It melts. Yes. So the ocean absorbs more heat. Yes. Melting the, more ice. Meaning there's more ocean showing during the ocean showing during the summer, absorbing more heat, melting. That's a positive feedback loop that's in place. Okay, so I can say I'm conscious of this, uh, uh, but if the Democratic National Committee is not conscious of it, and and if your swing voters who would swing to Trump are not conscious of it, then then what do we do? Nominate Bernie. Those swing <laughs> voters will come to Bernie. Those, yeah. that, that that's been resolved. Mm -hmm. The problem with climate change isn't the swing voters who have already made up their mind. They're going to go yeah. with Bernie. It's mm -hmm. the independent voters mm -hmm. who, most of them are telling pollsters they're going to vote for Trump. And still Bernie in polls beats Trump. They're the ones who have to be enlightened and, and, and made it very clear that in this election, it, it really comes, and this is true whether it's mm -hmm. Bernie versus Trump or Bernie versus Buttigieg or Bernie versus Biden or Bernie versus even Warren. The only candidate who propose, is proposing sufficient response to climate change to actually preserve the uh, climate, besides Bernie Sanders, is mm -hmm. Andrew Yang. So it's mm -hmm. going to be either, from a climate perspective, it's going to be Yang or Sanders or we burn. Uh, okay, well, beginning to sum up, uh, how can you bring this to the attention of, of politicians? And, uh, so the idea is to get the media to cover the story. That fact, the poll, polls show only Sanders beats Trump. You're not going to hear this on MSNBC, though, because they don't care if Trump is reelected. They don't want Bernie in there breaking up the media monopolies. They prefer Trump over Bernie. So you're not going to hear it on MSNBC. You're not going to see this discussed on CNN. This has to go out social media. You, you see this somewhere online. Again, uh, climate2020.us has this 
all laid out. You can share that video. You can share that website. We have to get this in before, not the DNC. They don't care. They'd rather have mm -hmm. Trump than Bernie Sanders. Most mm -hmm. of the elite would mm -hmm. rather have the Democratic Party elite would rather have Trump than Bernie Sanders. But the rank and file Democrats want to defeat Donald Trump. That's their thing. They don't, they want to pick the candidate who has most likely. And the fact is, polls are telling us that Bernie's not the most likely. He's the only one, as long as this remains a close race, he's the only one who can defeat Trump. So how do we get that out to them? Share this video. Share this program. Share this information. Share climate2020.us. Share it across social media. Share in emails to your aunt and uncle out in the Midwest. Get this information out because even supposed progressive media, a lot of that, the Humanist Report, uh, Rational National, and uh, Kyle Kalinske are all on the payroll of the DNC. They're not talking about the Sanders-Trump swing voters. So it's important for truly independent media like this and, and, and listeners of this media to get this information before Democratic Party uh, uh, voters. Because if Bernie doesn't go into mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee, I think is where the DNC is this year, if he does go in there with 50% or more of the delegates, Trump's going to be reelected. There, there's absolutely no doubt about that, as long unless there's a market crash. Okay, that's the prediction you're leaving with us with. We've been talking to, let's say, political analyst and political activist Victor Tiffany. This has been uh, the Ithaca DSA Presents program. I'm Wales Brown. Thank you all. One, two, one, two, three. Revolt Against Plutocracy won't just be covering the news about the necessary revolution in the United States. Sometimes, we'll be making the news. If you want to stay on top of the revolutionary actions and strategies of grassroots, genuine progressives, and our allies, please subscribe to our YouTube channel today.